Hello, and welcome back to the CSS Podcast. Today, we're talking about math. Yes, math. And specifically <laughs> trigonometry, because now you can do some pretty complex math in CSS. While this sounds fancy for the sake of being fancy, and to be fair, I also need to explore these a little bit more in my day to day. There are some pretty nice organic feeling effects that you can leverage these trigonometric functions to achieve, including in animations, layout, typography, and even in color thieving. So if you're ready to get nerdy and get inspired, you better get settled in and we'll dive into some trig functions. Yeah, get ready to get nerdy is like my calling card. I'm like, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm always there for get nerdy. Get ready, <laughs> get steady. No, I, I'm excited. Like I was reading these notes for the episode and there's so much that you can do with trig functions, like just reading through also some of the posts that people have created and the blogs people have created with these functions, like showing you how to do some really cool animations and other just like layout techniques, and even with theming, um, there's so much. And so I'm excited to kind of talk through some of the possibilities and dig into how to use some of these trig functions. It's like magic, right? It, things look like magic when you don't understand them well. And any math person would sit down and be like, all I did was use pow. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you, yeah, you said the sentence and it means nothing to me. <laughs> you know? So yeah, a lot of times I have to like really get hands on with things before I learn them. Uh, and one of the things about preparing for these show notes was I really wanted this to be grounded in, in practical use cases for the CSS and UI developer and not just be mathy for math's sake. But yeah, some people, it's just like one line of CSS and they knock out this incredible layout or they knock out this incredible curve on their color palettes and just really cool stuff you can do with math. So today we're going to be uh, getting practically nerdy as opposed to like arithmetically nervy, nerdy, arithmetically, arithmetically nerdy. That's, that's a phrase. It's really hard. Um, but it's, you know, nerdy with arithmetic. Anyway, we want to share a high level version of the capabilities with some interspersed use cases that make math approachable and meaningful. And just like Yuna said, we've got typography, layout, animation, and more. These are all places that math can do rad stuff. We've got four sections on math functions to share with you all today. Trig, exponential, arithmetic, and rounding functions. And trig functions are great for things like waves, vibrations, oscillations, circular motions. They deal with angles and ratios of sides too. We have exponential functions that are great for growth, decay, and compounding values, like things that grow or die at rates that quicken. And we have arithmetic functions that are great for compute and manipulation of numbers, kind of like number management, or even I think I get into one point, I'm like, these are kind of like accessibility uh, things. And then we also have rounding functions that are great for modifying values to a needed precision. So as of February 2024, almost all these functions are in every browser, and any of the ones that are missing are available in the beta or nightly releases of all these major browsers. So most of them are greenlit for you to use, but do check just in case on can I use. Uh, like, for example, the sign function, and I don't mean the S-I-N sign function, I mean S-I-G-N function. That one's only in Chrome Canary at the moment, but I anticipate that'll get promoted into stable soon enough. All right. Let's nerd out, Yuna, kick us off with some math. Let's start with sine, S-I-N function, and a sine, A-S-I-N function. So um, you can use these trigonometric functions in calc, um, and these calculate the trigonometric sine of a number. So some use cases would be sine waves, if you were trying to visualize sound waves, light waves, or other things that oscillate. In motion, you can also create circular motion or harmonic motion, like pendulums or springs. Or I had a demo where I had created a circular layout where um, items on the menu kind of trickled out in a circular way from one side to another around a circular plane. So thinking about things, not just in XY planes, but circles. Circles are fun. Um, in layout and UI, you can use these for more uniform sizing like with typography scales or scaling elements relative to each other. Uh, one example I recently looked at was Sané's example from like CSS Day last year where he showed using has to select elements before a target element and after the target element and then used sign functions to smoothly size them uh, re like relatively to each other, which was pretty cool. Um, in 3D, you can use sine functions for smooth curves to rotate objects around a base. That's kind of like the menu that I did or simulate realistic movements, um, which you can think of an example, like if you're thinking like what a human body looks like and how it moves and how your arm sort of oscillates around your elbow joint and has sort of springy easings if you kind of just like flop it and let it go. Um, so it was sort of like natural movement, even like running. You can also use the sign function for things like projectiles if you're creating a game or bullets. Like, uh, you know, if you ever played 
the cannon game on your calculator. <laughs> you know, you can simulate angles and arcs. Um, and then again, for waves and things like that, if you're creating some kind of music or audio visualization, um, that could be a cool use for sine and a sine too. Excellent. Yeah, the uh, talking about your body movement, that's in the Disney principles. They always said nothing humanistic or nothing that's organic and or like an animal uh, ever moves in a straight line at the same rate from one spot to the another. And so, yeah, you look at your elbow and it's always pivoting on that connection point, uh, which means it's never linear. It's always moving in an arc and circular. So anyway, super cool things you can do. You can implement Disney principles because of math. That's pretty sweet. Exactly. And I think what's really cool about these functions too is if you start leveraging the more, which is why I want to start leveraging the more in my UIs, you can make things feel really organic. Like I think organic is a really great word for that um, to just kind of showcase how these things work, like how the web can just feel a lot less linear um, in many ways. And uh, we do have the linear easing function now where you can have unlimited points. So you could do things like that in addition. Um, but yeah, there's a lot that you can do here. You can also use these not just directly in a calc, but you can set custom properties to uh, these trigonometric functions and then leverage them that way. So it's it's very flexible the way that you use them. Yeah. And the other kind of nice thing, like you're talking about, the linear easing function is very, uh, it's a predetermined spring. And when you're doing math, the math can know the distance that was traveled and spring a little less if it didn't travel very far. But if it traveled a long distance, it can, it can spring a lot. And so you get, again, that like mathematical dynamism. Is that a word? I just made it up. Uh, it's dynamic. Anyway, just nerdy. We're nerding that's, out that's already. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is going to be such a long episode. <laughs> get yeah, buckle up, y'all. <laughs> Although you should walk away with like, holy cow, math is super useful in my UI. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Co, uh, so COS and ACOS, so cosine and um, asymmetric cosine. And these calculate the you know the cosine of a number, which probably doesn't mean much to many of you. That sentence also doesn't mean much to me. But if you talk about the use cases for cosine and acosine, you have things like calculating angles and distances, analyzing the motion of projectiles and calculating their horizontal displacement. That also sounds confusing, but I think in context, like if we're making an anchor positioned element, you could find the distance between two things, calculate the horizontal displacement, and then other math functions will help your thing turn towards the, so you think about like 3D characters, they have to face something. And so they're using math to determine how to, which direction to face given the distance. You can also model uh, wave phenomena like sound and light. So just like we had sine and um, we could do. You can also calculate forces acting on structures and a cosine to determine angles for roof slopes. So again, more kind of like organic looking math effects that have to do with slopes and angles. And then game developers use cosine and a cosine for character movement and projectile trajectories, camera angles, and physics simulations. So you think about things that are following something else that need to always be pointed towards it. You know, like if you have like a an anchor in the center and something's moving around it like a, a tool tip, something could always put the point the arrow towards the element it's anchored to because you have math that can determine all these things based on these right angles. Uh, cool stuff. And if cos is cosine and sine sounded really familiar or similar to each other, that's because, yeah, a lot of the use cases are nearly the same. However, they are a little bit different and they're different in that they are complementary. So they both have wave-like effect that they oscillate between negative one and one. And the sine wave starts at zero and goes up while cosine waves start at one and go down. So in case you're looking for when and where to use those, uh, that can hopefully help you. Yes. Um, I think that these two are really handy, especially like I have used them in the context of anchor positioning elements relative to that sort of round center. You couldn't really do that before. You'd have to use JavaScript to calculate the positions, the XY positions to transform the movement of them. And now you can really use math directly in CSS. So really, really handy. So next we have tan and a tan, which is the next function. If you remember triangles, you know, this tan, you know, it calculates the trigonometric tangent of a number, but what does that mean? It's the opposite over the adjacent side. So the value of tangent depends on the angle, and it can be positive, negative, or undefined, depending on the positions that you're using it for. Um, so tan can be really helpful, again, for positioning things on an angle. You can also use sine and cosine for this, but um, some use cases here are calculating slopes. So you can calculate slopes of lines if we're thinking about anchoring, like the positioning, how it's relative to that center line. Um, gradients, so you can calculate slopes of gradients, design different types of gradients if you have um, multiple gradients even and you want to design them in some, some way. Um, for animation, you can calculate the relationship between force and displacement. So the amount of force, like if you have some kind of physics on your page 
or you can calculate the angle of a projectile's trajectory, again, if you're making some kind of game or like some kind of funky interactions, maybe instead of clicking on the button, you have to shoot the button. <laughs> Yeah, or confetti shoots out from the button and says success, you know, and you had all yeah. these little projectiles that shoot That's out and more they flutter down. Use yeah. case. <laughs> I like the idea of someone building a website <laughs> where you have to uh, shoot all the buttons with Nerf guns or with water guns. <laughs> nice. Did you see the DevTools perf thing that someone did? They set up uh, that game. Uh, oh, God, what's it called? Um, blocks. Anyway, you have the ball that bounces up and then you have the little paddle that shoots back up. That's really funny. And they're taking out the flame graph. So they're just like, oh, I'm fixing all my performance issues by just wiping out. That's so every funny. Block. It's pretty funny. Yep. I haven't seen that, but I love it. Um, so you could use that for this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you could also use it for movement, like a character's movement or camera controls, um, physics simulations involving angles, um, like a bouncing ball too, as we just mentioned. And it is also useful, again, for that anchoring, like keeping things um, always pointed towards an anchor, no matter where they are, where the tooltip is, or where the um, element item is. Um, so there's also a tan two, which I didn't even really know about, but this returns the inverse tangent of two values between negative infinity and infinity. And this function accepts two arguments and returns the number of radians representing an angle between negative 180 degrees and 180 degrees. So these values can be a number, a dimension, or a percentage. A couple of ways that you can use this. Uh, this is useful for determining the direction that maybe a character should face or like directionality um, for converting between Cartesian and polar coordinates like X, Y to magnitude and angle, um, which is useful for color map. Mm -hmm. So that might be something that you've run into um, if you're Adam Argyle. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can also use it to calculate slopes, angles, distances, uh, possibly for interactions or for layout. And um, you can calculate gradient direction at each pixel in an image. So that can be helpful for edge detection and for feature extraction uh, from those images. But what's really interesting is that you can also combine TAN and ATAN too. And uh, Jane Ori actually has an awesome post on using these together to extract values from ranges in CSS. So in this post, she says, fundamentally TAN and then using ATAN2 within TAN, sort of like TAN, open the C's, ATAN2 function, and then close both parentheses. This is just a scalar between two dimensions. And I was like, whoa, what does that mean? <laughs> so, so as I read on, uh, she shows you how to use only CSS to get the exact width and height of the viewport, which you can then also use for aspect ratio-based styling, which can be super useful. And then the equation for width in this case would be TAN, and then open parentheses, so you've got this function within that a second function, ATAN2, where the two values are 100 VW, so 100 viewport width units, and then one pixel. So this would be the inverse of 100 VW and one pixel, which is passed to TAN, which returns an integer like 400 if the viewport width is 400 pixels. So you could do that for width, you could do it for height. You get this, like, you know, you get the idea. You could do the same thing for container query units to calculate sizes containing mixed units. Um, you can use it to find out the pixel value size of a REM-based character for typography and like a bunch of other cool stuff. You just have to register length, set its value, and then convert it to numeric pixels with tan of you know surrounded by surrounding a tan too so i this kind of like blew my mind this post because i haven't done geometry in a long time and then i was reading this i was like wow it's so relevant to css like with typography with aspect ratio values based on dynamic sizing um i just love how creative people are <laughs> I love this post from Jane. <laughs> While you're explaining that, I'm like, I think someone could use this for fit width text. Yeah. Yeah, you could determine the size of the container and given some sort of base number, determine what your range is like and do something smart with your available space there and then choose a font size that makes it fit perfectly. Right. There's got to be a way to like fit your text into the area with this. Yeah. And even with like container queries, you can't get the aspect ratio of a container query. You can get the size, you can get the width, you can get the height in, you know, specific block context. Wait, you can get the, you can't get the aspect ratio. Like I have a container query that asks if it's in the orientation portrait or landscape. I have a demo that will pivot based on the container size being portrait landscape. But this doesn't work for dynamically sized elements, such as elements within a grid. That's where it falls back. Where mm. this could, I, I imagine that this would resolve that problem. 
Cool. We got some prototyping to do. I'm just curious. You know, I I'm not sure. I yeah, we have to prototype. But like, I've run into that issue with container queries where I'm using a container in a flex or a grid layout, and you can't really get the block size because it's automatically positioned. Um, so you run into like the circular dependency problem of sizing it. Uh, so, but it sounds like this could give you that value, which you could then use in a container query. <laughs> anyway, just some thoughts. But uh, if you want to learn if more about this, your mind isn't blown enough yet, everybody. <laughs> anyway, Adam and I are like actively like blowing our minds as we're talking about it, talking it through. Um, you can find the article in our show notes if you want to learn more about this technique. I definitely recommend you check it out. Yep, I definitely uh, also had lots of ideas while I was studying for this and and implemented one. We'll, we'll get there. Um, but okay, so that was it for the trig functions, and now we're on to exponential functions. So this can be this is going to be a lot of your growth and decay, where something maybe starts out slow and then it gets fast and then it gets slow again. So kind of maybe easing uh, use cases and stuff like that. But the first one we're going to talk about is POW, uh, P-O-W. And I've, this is, I think, the easiest entry point if you're looking to sort of prototype and get started with these math functions. POW has some really cool, easy use cases. And we'll get into those in a, in a second. But essentially, POW calculates the base raised to the power of a number. So like if you do POW 2 comma 3, it calculates 2 to the power of 3, which is 8. It's like 2 times 3. Um, note also here that POW only works with raw numbers, so don't give it any units. And if you do want to deal with units in POW, do it in a calc. So that's sort of a hot tip. A lot of these only accept unitless values, and but you can convert them with calc into some sort of meaningful unit uh, that you want to use. So some use cases for POW is, well, it turns out E equals MC squared is a POW-based uh, mathematical concept. Not that that's... Thing I learned. Not that, you know, calculating <laughs> that is helpful in UI, but I thought that was an interesting tidbit. You can use POW to find compounded interest or to calculate it. You can use it to discover area and volume calculations. You can use it for random number techniques. So I thought that was a cool use case. So if you're feeling like random isn't random enough, you can throw in some of these mathematical functions and really change up uh, the values that are in there. And then, of course, things like physics, like projectile motion or gravity. So you can also think about gravity has a decay and projectiles have, um, uh, yeah, they shoot out. So you can got use cases like that. And uh, there's even more use cases beyond just, uh, you know, kind of game related things. But Anna Tudor has a great example of using POW for layout. So at different viewport aspect ratios, they change the exponent, which is kind of the thing that's multiplying the value uh, in a grid columns repeat. So basically what they're doing is making different amounts of columns based on available viewport size. So they just kind of change the different um, exponent at different widths. And then they can change the number of columns that are in there in this nice little minimal math way. It was kind of cool. And then also uh, the articles in the show notes, you can find it there. Also, Dan Wilson has a really awesome typography example that creates mathematically harmonious font size ramps that can be easily scaled by just adjusting one custom property. And their article is also in the show notes. I was very inspired by it when I first read it, which was a couple months ago, and prototyped an open props version two variable pack that uses the same strategy and makes it easy to import. And then you just change one number and you can change the whole font scale of, of your typography. And you get this. So you think about like H1 is really big and H6 is really small. And a lot of people want a ratio that goes from that large one to the small one, something on a curve or something that's nice, something that decays. And so we use POW and we can easily create a method of decay from the large font size to the small one. Just really cool stuff. Yeah. And um, if you're using this, it's going to be really small number changes. It's going to be like 0 0.01, 0 0.05 changes because <laughs> it makes a really big difference on the type scale. But it's really, really cool to see it in action because it does create a nice fluid type scale. This is a big problem that I feel like designers used to hand pick values for. Yeah. Because it was too hard to do it in a dynamic way using the functions that we had just with multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. But now you get these organic feeling smooth changes between values that work awesome for type scales. So like Yeah, and remember CSS locks, you can pretty much use clamp to do what the locks do. Yes. So you say never never font size go below this, never font size above this, but here's your exponent ratio with a pow in the middle that gives you this really cool ramp. That's a really good idea because usually I've just been using like viewport width sizing, which is linear. But if I was using POW as a part of the calculation function based on viewport width, can you do that? Can you do that with the viewport width? You'd have to use it in calc. So yeah, like we said, yeah. it has to be unitless inside of POW, but you could use a calc, uh, which inside of a clamp, you get the calc for free. Uh, yeah, you stick your math right in the middle using uh, viewport units and a POW function. Wow. We need a new like copy and paste clamp typography function for people that Ooh. leverages this. 
Nice. Yes. It's time. It's time, my friends. Uh, all right. So, so the <laughs> we're next... feeling inspired. Are you feeling inspired yet? Get ready. This is like we're the like the best episode through. ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, next is square root, and this calculates the square root of a number, which you're probably familiar with. But if you're not, a square root is the factor that you can multiply by itself to get that number. So, for example, the square root of four is two. Square root of nine is three, et cetera, et cetera. So like POW, this only works with raw numbers. Don't pass any units into square root, but you can do a lot of interesting things with it. So uh, you can use it for the Pythagorean theorem, like find the distance between two points on a map or the distance between two anchored elements. Does anybody do the traveling salesman problem when they were doing computer science in school? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I haven't heard Pythagorean theorem in like 20 years. So, yeah, so you could use for anchoring um, or distance, which you could also then use to adjust the width, maybe like the thickness of an SVG line, which I've seen people use like SVG lines kind of as placeholders to style like connectors between anchored elements. Yeah. Um, and the wider you have it, at least when I was playing with it, like it sort of stretches out. So you could maybe make adjustments there or um, maybe you wanted to, I don't know, restyle things based on the distance. So that's useful. Um finding the distance that an element has traveled based on acceleration and time. So that could also be useful for games or for like a train or starting and stopping, or if you're animating things like scrolly telling into the viewport and you want to give it some more realistic motion and physics, you could do that. Cool. Just some thoughts, <laughs> kinetic <laughs> energy of an element, so like speaking about movement and energy. So uh, you could do that with like the square root, square root of the velocity in an animation. Um, you can also adjust the tension of a wave or wave propagation, uh, find the standard deviation, like the amount of dispersion in a data set, styling it based on the dispersion. You could you know, create infographics or, again, for, for really random number generation. <laughs> awesome. I just remembered that Roma has a, an anchor example that keeps the points connected between two items and you can move it around. I wonder if they were using math in there. Um, probably. Um I got to look into that again. Yeah, I'd have to look that up too. So maybe that will be in the show notes. Maybe not. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. There's a lot of links in the show notes, so I'm not sure it needs more. Also follow uh, Roma. Their work is really awesome. Yes. Kizu dev. Yep. Kizu. Kaizu, Kizu, whatever. They both sound it's cool. Kizu.dev for the website. And I love their articles. Always very inspiring. Yeah, the typography is nice. Like they're a great designer. Also really interactive posts. Very well We're done. We're big fans. I yeah. got to get I gotta get a signature. <laughs> oh yeah, next week. All right. So the next one is Hypot, uh, which is H-Y-P-O-T. And that's for hypotenuse. And this calculates the square root of the sum of the squares of its arguments. This function does accept units. Ooh, isn't that fancy? <laughs> and it's used to find the length of the hypotenuse, uh, the side opposite of the right angle of a, tr of a triangle or a square. And it does this by squaring both the, oh, I guess it's not a triangle, this one's particularly squares, but it squares both the other sides, adds them together, and then square roots the sum. And this, this, so you can pass in an arbitrary amount of parameters, which is another interesting factor of this one that I believe distinguishes it from the JavaScript version. Um, and it will square all of them. So you can pass it all these different values and then we'll add them together and return the square root of that. So like an example is I can say hypot, open parentheses, 30 pixels, comma, 40 pixels. And what that's essentially gonna do is do a square root, open parentheses, 900 pixels plus 1600 pixels, and then give me um, the root sum, which is 50 pixels. So it's kind of like finding a healthy middle ground, but it also can change uh, depending on the values we put in there. But that one in particular, high pot, open parentheses, 30 pixels, 40 pixels will return 50 pixels. Um, it could be kind of useful for all sorts of stuff like Pythagorean theorem again, charting libraries and anchoring position, 3D environment, distance between elements, collision detection. So you can calculate mm. the distance between the centers of two elements. So you can see like how much overlap do they have. And then there's Euclidean distance for comparing data points and clustering them. So it's kind of like the opposite of measuring the dispersion of a data you're measuring or uh, instigating a clustering effect. And then music uh, visualization it can also be used in there. Huh, that's cool. The collision detection is really interesting use case because you might also want to apply some kind of overlap style for that too. Ooh, yeah. You could style them differently if they're touching than if they're... Drag and drop, like anything, yeah. Cool. Collision detection. Uh, okay. 
<laughs> there's there's so much here. Uh, log is the next thing we're going to talk about, or logarithm, which calculates the logarithm of a number, uh, and that is the inverse of an exponent. So log accepts two parameters. Uh, the second parameter is optional, so you could you could just have one, but the optional second parameter allows you to change the base from base e to a new number. And this also, I was discussing this episode with Adam before we started recording. Like this is one example of where things are a little bit different also between JavaScript and CSS with some of these trig functions and math functions and how they they work the same, but the syntax is different. So just kind of keep that in mind if you're used to writing these in JavaScript, just check how the syntax is changed here. So the use case here, you can measure intensity. So you can measure sound intensity if you're doing music visualization. Um, you could uh, create a relationship between music notes and their frequencies because they're logarithmic, a logarithmic relationship, like an octave doubling of frequency. Um, you could also visualize uh, earthquake magnitude, like the Richter scale. So that's cool. Uh, and it also shows growth and decay. So if you wanted to create some sort of visualization of growth and decay, log is really great for that. So it's sort of about intensity relationships, magnitude. Awesome. And then, so yeah, the inverse of logarithm is exponent, which you said was the log was, anyway, they're the complementary <laughs> ones. Um, and it calculates- I feel like people know exponent more than log. We should have started with that one. <laughs> I, yeah, really? I feel like I knew what logarithms were more than exponents. Um, <laughs> shows how much we knew before we started this. <laughs> uh, so exponent calculates e raised to the power of a number. It also doesn't support units. And it's kind of like a shorthand pow. Like an example is exponent three is the same as pow e comma three. Uh, just kind of interesting. And use cases are modeling population growth, for example, radioactive decay, which is just fun to say, bacterial growth, right? So lots of organic things that happen in nature are, are measured and work against these mathematical computations. We have probability density, which is apparently a cornerstone of t statistics, which I didn't know because you can normalize probabilities and start to kind of predict them, which also exponent is good for predicting. So people use exponents um, for stock uh, if they want to try to get smart about predicting where a stock is going to go, they can attempt to use math to do that. Just buy, never sell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a good strategy. <laughs> so we're a strategy. We're not financial advisors. Don't take our advice. Yeah. Uh, okay, back to the math. Uh, the next section is all about arithmetic functions. So these are things that you can do around numeric values and calculations, I guess. Uh, so the first one is rem, and this is the remainder, but it's just REM functions. And unlike the rem unit, it is a rem function for the remainder. So the remainder function exposes what remains after division. So if in the example of like nine divided by four, because four goes into nine twice, that leaves a remainder of one. So if you had rem nine comma four, the resulting value would be one. So with this function, you can use units, but they need to be of the same type of unit. So if you have something like 45 degrees and 0.5 rad, both are the angle type of unit or like a turn as well. You can use the rem function to take these mixed units, uh, even though they're mixed because they're the same type. So you can use both of those in the rem function or anything like unitless, like the example of rem nine comma four, the world is your oyster, but you can't mix like 45 degrees and nine pixels, for example. So remainders can be negative two if that is handy, which it could come in handy. Um, and some examples could be for like circular arrays or buffers. Like if you're making a looping animation or pattern in CSS that repeats after a certain number of steps, getting the remainder. Um, so you could like wrap back around to the beginning of something when it hits the end, or even know when it hits the end. Like if you want to use this as a Boolean value too, that could be really useful. Just using is the value greater than zero, like for a Boolean value. Um, also for timekeeping, like converting minutes to hours and remaining minutes. So you could do clock calendars or other things with it or for layouts. So you could do this for like creating a grid layout uh, where the width of each column is determined by the remainder of the total width divided by the number of columns. So that makes sure that when you're filling the space, you're filling the column space evenly. Um, that That's like a more complex example, but definitely useful. And earlier, um, Adam was talking about how Anna Tudor used POW in a grid layout. So you could also 
you know, fork that and try to use REM instead or remainder instead if you wanted to. So some similar ideas there around grid layouts. Um, and then also similar to remainder is mod, which is modulo. So it's MOD, the mod function. This is also a remainder, but it performs division. And instead of returning the quotient, it returns the remainder after division. It's slightly different from rem, even though they both return remainders, mod always takes the positive or negative sign of the returned value based on the second parameter. So similar to rem, mod takes two values, uh, two arguments, but the positive or negative comes from the second one. Um, it's also slightly different in that if the second value is negative, the division must first go from that negative value up to one and then up to the first parameter. So it's definitely one of those functions that you need to like actually use and play with to grok probably. Um, but similar use cases you can use for timekeeping like RAM, circular uh, looping scenarios like RAM, um, even or odd detection. So you can use that for sorting. And again, I think that these are useful for Boolean values too. Um, if you were trying to identify if there's a remainder or not. So that can be useful um, when you're creating layout. Yep, very nice. Um, the round function is next, and this one is particularly useful for me in a lot of ways. Like I used to do in JavaScript, I'd constantly be doing a calculation in JavaScript, and then I'd have this huge number with all these floating point values, and uh, I would always round it out because I'm like, the browser doesn't care about 0.224 pixels. Uh, it just wants to know what is the pixel value. And so round, I can now move that work into CSS. So JavaScript can do less, set um, values more directly, and CSS can handle the rest of it. So uh, round, it modifies a number to a specified precision, uh, typically by rounding it to the nearest integer or a certain number of decimal places. Um, yeah, and you can use this for with JavaScript for style calculations. Put your custom properties, wrap your custom properties in a round function and just sort of like make it kind of neat. Uh, this function accepts, accepts two parameters, which is different than JavaScript. The first parameter is the value you want to round, and the second parameter is a precision number. So normally in JavaScript, you'd say math.floor, math.seal, and then you do like two fixed or something like that, and you don't have to do that dance. CSS has it all kind of built into the one function. Uh, so the second parameter is the precision number. Um, it's usually one, so that's why it's an optional value. It defaults to one which would round to the nearest integer. Um, but if you wanted to round to something else, like here's a good example with CSS. Let's say you were messing with opacity and you didn't want to round it to one or zero. You need to round it to a floating point value. You could use point one as that second parameter and then it will round to the nearest point one, uh, which is kind of cool. You, you, just depends if you want to keep the float values or not. You get that second parameter to do that. And these parameters do accept units, so feel free to pass it pixels and stuff. But again, make sure that they're the same type, even if you're mixing units. So if they're length type, you could use you know character units and pixel units. Uh, just don't mix uh, your types up there. So a good example here, or just a few examples, is if I did round, open up parentheses, 2.2, comma 1, I would get 2. It's going to round to the nearest integer, and it's going to round down by default in this particular case because it's using the nearest uh, keyword, which we'll get into in a second, but I don't have to pass it nearest because that's the default value. I can say round open parentheses 9.8 comma 1, and that's going to round me up to 10 to the nearest integer. Uh, let's say you wanted to round to one decimal place. So I could do round open up parentheses 2.23 and comma 0 0.1, and it's going to shave that 3 off the end of it and round it to 2.2. So that's the nearest 0.1 decimal. And then we have round 0 0.48 comma 0 0.1, and that's going to round you to 0.5. So that 0.48 became 0.5 because of the 0.1 precision value that we passed in there. But wait, there's more with round. It also <laughs> accepts a third parameter, dun, dun, dun. So if it didn't sound kind of cool enough already, uh, kind of making JavaScript look a little messy, we have a third parameter. And this parameter lets you specify whether you want to round up, down, nearest, or farthest, which I thought sounded a lot like gradient syntax, which is kind of cool. The default value is nearest, like we've co covered already. Um, but let's say you want to round up. So you'd say round, open parentheses, up as the keyword, comma, 15 degrees comma 45 degrees so you want to round 15 degrees up to the nearest 45 degree um, precision value and that would round you to 45 degrees so you can create snapping really easy you can snap up snap down using this round function um, and so I like to think of these keywords as the same thing as you get with like math.seal and math.floor uh, but we have a nice handy keyword but there's also there's more <laughs> 
I love you selling me on round right now. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, you need an infomercial about the round function. It has a keyword called two dash zero. So you can round open parentheses two dash zero comma 21 pixels comma five pixels. And that will round you to 20 pixels. It rounded you to the nearest zero value that was still of a precision type that is within a five pixel range. So that's like rounding to the nearest tens, uh, which is kind of cool. So it rounds to the nearest zero based value. I thought that was pretty neat. So, okay, some use cases for round. That was a lot of like syntax explanation and examples and stuff like that. Um, I prefer removing subpixel values like I talked about before. So you can round to the nearest pixel and this uh, can aid in subpixel rendering, uh, which might create unpredictable experiences. Also, sometimes rounding can make animations a little jittery. Sometimes the subpixel values are nice. So don't always round test, uh, you'll see. Uh, it's nice for measurements and conversion handling. It's nice for scores and grading. It's great for presenting money. It's great for displaying data. And I feel like a lot of these are about helping me read the data easier. Almost like the round function is an accessibility feature because you don't have to show confusing values to people. You can round them to something that's easier for their head to wrap around as they're glancing at the data. So kind of cool use cases for round and some superpowers. Nice. I love that. Uh, definitely a useful function that uh, I would be happy to not have to use in JavaScript anymore. Yeah. So we have a final little bonus section at the end here. And there's sort of, more. <laughs> <laughs> and there's more. To sort of wrap it up, uh, two more really useful math functions. Um, and these are called piecewise functions. So the first one is called sine, S-I-G-N. So unlike the sine and cosine functions, this function determines the sine of a number, which which means positive, negative, or zero in this case. So what is the, the sine? I don't even know how to say that without using the word. It's like, does it have the dash in front of it or not right. kind of thing? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this uh, function only takes one argument. And it sounds simple, but this can be really helpful, especially if you consider throwing a calculation inside of it and not just a value. So you can do sine and then calc inside of sine. So you get the sine, you know, is it positive, negative, or zero of the calculation inside of it. So that can be helpful with anchor positioning and dynamic directionality. Um, so some use cases include changing direction, so for layouts or animations. Um, it's also useful for knowing when something is at the end and take that time to switch to a different direction. So you can sort of use this for looping or uh, with some of the other functions that we've already covered in this article. Um, another useful use case of this is toggling visibility. So whether it's positive or negative, or on that note, like using it as some sort of a switch. So this could help with some Boolean logic, whether the sign is positive or negative. Um, that can be helpful if you're talking about animations or other types of interactions. Um, another one uh, for use cases here is dynamic gap. So that's margin or padding based on the number of items or sizes of uh, you know the items in a layout. And then also knowing if an angle or size is positive or negative, which could help with anchor positioning or positioning. Um, you know, we talked about Roman's example where he had positioned it based on like connecting to value points. So at some point, you had to recalculate essentially going from left to right the image. Um, so this could possibly help with that. Again, sort of just talking about it as as it comes up, but kind of knowing the directionality could help and the sign, the positive or negative aspects. Very nice. Lots of interesting use cases for just knowing if something is, if a calculation is positive or negative. Yeah, you have things like you don't want it to go too far off the left of the screen. So, um, you know, is its left position, is the pixel value uh, negative? And you're like, oh, then, then clamp it at zero, for example, or something like that. Uh, and then the last one we have here in the piecewise functions is abs. And this isn't a workout reference. This is a <laughs> reference to absolute. And so this is the absolute value of a number. Uh, is its distance from zero, regardless of its positive or negative. This one I've used a lot in various calculations, and I had fun trying to tell my kids about what it was the other day. But it takes one argument, which is a number, and returns the non-negative value of that number. Uh, and I could see this being really helpful with anchor positioning also. But some of the use cases are dynamic margins. That way you know it will always be at least zero. You can find the difference between values, so when you're not interested in the negative value and parallax effects or hover effects. Think about like if you have something 
uh, in the center of your viewport of your eyes right now and your hand moves to the right hand side that's like positive 200 pixels but then your hand moves to the left hand side of the thing in the center now that's negative 200 pixels what you're interested though in is the distance from your hand to that center point and you don't care if it's positive or negative you just want to know how many pixels away is it like its actual position isn't relevant in its positive or negative state just give me the number and so you can just wrap that value in abs and you get that um you get that feature, which is kind of cool. And then you could wrap that in sign and just get the positive or negative. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It all comes full circle. Oh, that was a lot of stuff to cover, but there's definitely no way that we could cover all these cases in this episode. And I hope that what we've done is at least illuminated a lot about the different types of math functions that you now have at your fingertips and how you can use these all in UI development. Nice. And check out the show notes for rad examples of math and CSS. I uh, went home after making all these notes and I made a physics simulation demo all in CSS during the because uh, I, I realized that a JavaScript version I was doing was just using sine and cosine and a few of these functions and exponent and square root. And I was like, oh, I, I, could, I have all these functions in CSS now. And so check out the show notes. I got it working and I even added some levers and sliders so that you can change the custom properties, like change the mass and the amount of tension that's in there. And you ultimately get a different physics behavior from the element being animated. It works with transitions and keyframes, which is kind of cool. This is so cool. Like I, I also love all of the examples that we sort of talked about verbally, but like seeing them visually is really helpful. So definitely recommend checking those out. And I can already see also like using these in, like transitions, like entry and exit animations for popovers and menus that open. Uh, there's just so many cool things. <laughs> Sorry. Super duper cool. Oh, no, it's totally, totally true. Um, and the last final tip here was, is if you are writing these kinds of styles, if you're using the, these math functions, you're doing something pretty complex with them, consider putting them into a well-named custom property that describes the intent and helps document what it is that you're doing. So that way somebody doesn't show up and look at this, you know, nested, mass of math functions and expect someone to edit it six months later. Uh, that's just unkind to do to self or Yes, others. I was going to say to <laughs> others, but also to yourself. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Also, code comments, always good. But I love the examples of seeing these in custom properties. Like that to me is great because when you then use them together, combining calc functions in other places, you know what's happening in the pieces of that algorithm. It's an algorithm that you're putting together. So thank you for joining us. If you're still listening, you get a gold star. And I had a lot of fun uh, doing this episode with you, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I had fun too. And yeah, y'all, su you survived the math episode. This one is about as heavy as they get. It might be a record length. So we'll see. But if you all have any CSS questions, any math questions, we'd love to answer them on the show. Just tweet us with the hashtag CSS podcast. I'm Yuna on Twitter, X Mastodon. It's at UNA. And I'm at Argyle Inc. A-R-G-Y-L-E-I-N-K. Your question could help a lot of people. And if you liked the show, please give us a review on whatever podcast app you're using or just share this with a nerdy friend because those reviews help other people discover our show. And that means that we could make the time, prioritize the time to deliver more shows and better content for you. Yo, check out the math in the CSS episode. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, y'all. CSS isn't a programming language. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye.